So our speaker this afternoon is Raymond Tallis. Raymond um, was Professor of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Manchester and a consulting physician in healthcare and of the elderly in Salford. He retired from medicine in 2006 to concentrate on his writing. Okay, so he's been very productive over the past 20 years, um, publishing fiction, volumes of poetry, and 23 books on the philosophy of mind, philosoph philosophical anthropology, literary theory, and the nature of culture um, and art criticism. Now, you will see that there is a cornucopia of uh, Raymond's books out on the bookstall, so I entreat you to go and have a look and peruse those in the break as well. You may know Raymond uh, Tallis's name as he's a, a, a well-known uh, spokesperson for uh, humanist issues and he's contributed extensively to co uh, contemporary debates on assisted dying. Now today he'll be talking about was Schubert, brackets, just a musical brain? So without further ado, please welcome Raymond Tallis. Thank you very much indeed, Fern, and thank you, Andrew, and the team for inviting me to this Faith and Science Weekend. Um, it's fantastic to be here. I think it's the second, only the second time my wife and I have been to Malvern, possibly the third time, and it just looks absolutely gorgeous. In fact, I wish I wasn't here. If I was a free man, I would be out in the hills not giving this talk, so there you go. But you are free, so what you're doing here, God only knows, but uh, there you go. Um, I, it gets worse, because the talk I'm going to give is going to leave neither faith nor science happy. Those of you who have a supernatural persuasion and those of you who are naturalistic persuasion will both go home wanting to ask for your money back. So there you go. <laughs> but I'm going to come at the issue uh, from, from a, a rather obliquely. I'm going to look at what kind of creatures we are through looking at the nature of art. And a particular artist, Schubert, whom I admire pretty well as much as anybody else. So although this is a story about Schubert, it's really also a story about you. So we'll eventually arrive at the overall aim, which is to underline the extent to which we are neither piece of nature nor entirely a part of nature, that we're neither supernatural creatures nor naturalistic blobs. That's the position that I'll be advocating, but only indirectly. So there you go. So let's now focus on Schubert, which I'll be talking about. He'll be the, as it were, the center of my talk uh, for, for most of the time. When the Australian, Austrian playwright Franz Grillparze asserted in his funeral oration for Schubert that here we bury greater treasure, a great treasure and greater promise, he didn't know the half of it. The definitive catalogue of Schubert's compositions lists nearly a thousand items. Among them are perhaps the greatest song cycles ever written, seven completed symphonies and three incomplete ones, including, of course, the great unfinished as well as the incomparable late piano sonatas. I could go on and on, but I won't. But a quarter of Schubert's output would have sufficed to establish him as a major figure in Western classical music. And yet he lived for little more than a decade after he came to musical maturity. His last year, when he was scarcely into his 30s and probably knew he was dying, was, as Benjamin Britten has plausibly claimed, the most miraculous year in the history of music. The great symphony in C, the Schwenengesang leader, the last three piano sonatas, and the peerless string quartet in C were only some of the highlights. Now, almost by definition, the art of a genius is underdetermined by their life. But with Schubert, the mismatch between life and work seems particularly extreme. The 12th of 14 children, of whom only five survived, this quintessentially romantic composer was physically unattractive. The short sighted and stocky dwarf, as he was described, the little mushroom, was rejected as totally unserviceable by the military selection panel. His love affairs were one-sided. Not one woman he truly loved returned his feelings, and yet he was not a misogynist. He was forced to earn a living in uncongenial ways, but he was not embittered by a sense of entitlement. While he was recognised in his immediate circle, and even beyond, this was scarcely proportionate to his achievement. To the very end, he couldn't guarantee that even commissioned work would be accepted, and most of what he wrote was not played in his lifetime. For over half of his magnificent final decade, he was ill with syphilis, compounded by the ghastly side effects of mercury. Now, given such an unpromising outer life, those who cannot tolerate the inexplicable have turned to his inner life to explain his torrents of masterpieces. Psychoanalysts, of course, have been on the case, but we may at once reject their one-size-fits-all explanations that see the same processes, tensions, and dynamisms in all of us. They offer nothing to help us understand how a man could complete the B-flat 
piano sonata with its soul-freezing and at times terrifyingly beautiful 25-minute opening movement a few weeks from his death, while coping with the distinctly unromantic misery of headaches and vomiting and stomach pain as the spirochetes working their way through his body were joined by typhoid. But the appeal to unconscious drives dies hard. Doctor and musician Roger Neighbour has offered a more customised psychoanalytical explanation. He notes in his essay, The Little Mushroom and the Blighted Twin, that Schubert was much smaller than his siblings and speculates that he'd suffered intrauterine starvation, starvation in the wound, as a result of competition from a twin brother who had died in the womb. This early catastrophic bereavement accounted, so Dr. Neighbour tells us, for an emotional precocity and a depth of feeling that is rather ordinary and generally cheerful, despite many deaths of children, would not justify. An abiding sense of loss and incompleteness prompted, so Dr. Neighbour says, a compulsive search for the missing other half. He goes further and connects the death throes of, of Schubert's womb mate with the dactylic rhythm, long, short, short, long, short, short, heard so often as in Death in the Maiden or the Wander Fantasy, Fantasia, and the sudden volcanic interruptions that sometimes inexplicably break, break into the sunny lyricism. The image of Schubert, haunted by months spent sharing an intrauterine bed with a dead twin, has a gothic power. But there are many reasons for dismissing fetal memories as an explanation of his achievements. The most obvious is the conscious care, the attention to detail that was essential to his work. He took lessons in counterpoint a few weeks before he died. Nothing could be further from a primal scream than the endlessly worked over final sonatas, which reveal the death-haunted man to be a highly self-critical artist. The appeal to deep psychological forces, whose consequences one would expect to be untidy, to say the least, misses the transcendent craftsmanship that is the necessary condition of genius. The search for solutions to problems that only the artist can see, the transformation of seemingly simple melodies that appear from nowhere, the willingness to learn from revered, revered masters, most notably Beethoven, and from one's own failures and successes, that infinite capacity for taking pains that Thomas Carlyle spoke of, these are closer to the essence of Schubert's genius than unresolved emotional conflicts. Besides, the appeal to early trauma to explain artistic genius does not withstand the observation that childhood trauma is all too common and our artistic genius all too rare. While the joy of creation may help artists to come to terms with themselves and their world, their works move us only because they transcend any private forces that may drive them. They address or dress the universal wound of the human condition that ultimately derives from our having been born for insufficient reason into a sometimes hostile world and are consequently fated to die after a life of incomplete meanings. Psychological disturbance is not of itself much help. Besides, the reliable image we have of Schubert is of a man of striking sanity, generous to his friends, and convivial when he was not prostrated by illness. We get more enlightenment, though nothing that comes anywhere near an explanation, from looking at the culture of the city which Schubert shared with Beethoven, or even thinking about Schubert's father, who appreciated music, and teachers and friends who early acknowledged his talents. From thinking about the famous Schubertiads, rather than putative, early traumatic, traumata, automating creativity. But even attempts to account for Schubert's genius by looking at the world in which he lived his short life have all the vices of a post hoc explanation. After all, as we've already observed, Schubert's circumstances hardly favoured his sublime creativity. And if they were sufficient to explain what he achieved, we would have had hordes of Schubert's produced by these very same circumstances. The truth is that no explanation appealing to psychodynamic forces, prenatal experiences or historical circumstances can get close to the utter singularity of the man who produced such a wonderful body of work in which profound feeling and technical brilliance are effortlessly reconciled, are indeed as inseparable as the recto and verso of a sheet of paper. So all explanations have to appeal to general factors in order to seem persuasive or even intelligible. And of course, there is absolutely nothing general about Schubert. But the ache for explanation persists. 
In a world enthralled to neuroscience, those who state, as a friend of mine did many years ago, that Schubert's genius is explained just by the fact that he had a musical brain, was parroting what is now, 30 years later, orthodoxy. And this is yet another expression of the general expectation that human beings will ultimately be explained in terms of the activity of their evolved brains, and that the combination of neuroscience and evolutionary theory will bring us closer to understanding what human beings are, and in particular, the extraordinary phenomenon that is music. The brain research will explain both the creation and appreciation of music, in a deed of all arts. How Schubert came to be such, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> how Schubert came to be such a genius, and why his music gives us pleasures so profound that they change our lives. It's important to discuss this because we need to think about ways in which the spectacularly successful scientific enterprise and its vision of the world can be reconciled with other, no less important ways of understanding our lives and our human nature, ways that come from the humanities and, more importantly, from the arts. And this is the great cognitive challenge of the 21st century, and it's important to head off myths that get in the way of meeting that challenge. Now, I'm sure that there are places where science and the arts can cast light on each other. They are, after all, both products of human beings at their most awake, their most inspired. Of course, science tends to be more collective enterprise than the arts. But those places lie very deep, and we won't find them if we don't dig deep enough. If, as so often happens, we use somewhat crude science to understand greatly simplified arts, in particular music, as we see in contemporary neuroesthetics, the theme of this talk. Now, it will be difficult to exaggerate the importance of music in our lives. When Nietzsche said that without music, life would be a mistake, he was exaggerating only a little. And its profound mystery casts light on the mystery that is ourselves. It reaches to the bottom of our humanity. There's a deeply moving passage in Kafka's Metamorphosis, that terrifying story in which a man wakes up one day to find he's been turned into a beetle. Towards the end of the story, he overhears some music, and noting how much it moves him, he thinks to himself, can I still be an animal when music so captivates me? Man, perhaps, is the music-making animal at least as much as he is the talking animal. And this must be why the music maker has always had a special place in society, highlighted by the anthropologist, Claude Levi-Strauss. Music, he says, is a language by whose means messages are elaborated that can be understood by the many, but sent out only by the few. It unites the contra contradictory character of being at once intelligible and untranslatable. These facts make the creative music a being like the gods and make music itself the supreme mystery of human knowledge. So there's the challenge. How does neuroscience, or more particularly, the young science of neuroesthetics, shape up in meeting this challenge? Very poorly, and I hope I'll persuade you of this. And I'm going to spell out why, though I emphasize that my purpose in doing so is positive, not negative. At the very least, I hope that by highlighting the deficiencies of neurobiological approaches to music, I will actually highlight the extraordinary nature of music itself, and indeed, of man, the music-making animal. Let me begin with neuroscience research into the appreciation of music. This has many dimensions, but let me start on the ground floor, as it were, with research into the perception of musical sounds. Using methods of recording brain activity, such as fMRI scans and PET scans, positron emission tomography, researchers claim to identify the different brain areas responsible for detecting and responding to pitch, to harmony, to melody, and other features of music. For example, we are told that tempo activates areas in a particular part of the cortex, the parietal, the insula, the frontal and prefrontal cortex. And the area said to be associated with pitch perception is located, as you can see in the picture here, in what's called the superior temporal gyrus. Now, how much does this tell us about the experience of music? Not very much, I would maintain. And it's interesting to consider why it doesn't. At the most basic level, given that we are not in real life served up these elements of music, pitch, 
harmony, tempo, and so on independently, we learn little about the perception of real sounds, less about the perception of real sounds in the bubbling mess of the real world, even less about the experience of music, and less still about the impact of great music in our lives. We experience melodies as a whole. We don't separately experience pitch or tempo or tonality. What's more, we all have brains that function in roughly the same way, but we don't all experience the same melodies in the same way. Tastes from person to person, from group to group, from age to age vary. More to the point, we ourselves don't always experience the same melody in the same way. My own sensitivity varies from time to time, within an hour or a day. Listening and re-listening, tenth listening and a thousandth listening are different experiences. And context is all. And that context may include knowledge of the composer or of the tradition from which she or he was drawing, whether you're listening intently in a concert hall or overhearing the music as you down, drive down the motorway, and what memories or associations a familiar piece of music may or may not awaken. Not all studies have focused on isolated aspects of individual musical sounds. Some have looked at the response to whole melodies. The findings here are conflicting, and Ruda Patel, a leading researcher in the field, asserts that music engages everything above the neck. Robert Zator, however, another well-respected figure, argues that there are specific effects of music on particular parts of the brain. And in particular, he's focused on the famous shiver down the spine. He and his colleagues, you can see these beautiful pictures here, used a technique called positon emission tomography, or form of scanning, to look for the way the intensity of the pleasure given by the music correlated with how much blood was flowing in different parts of the cerebral cortex. They found that when the shivers were felt down the spine, the following areas lit up. Ventral striatum, amygdala, orbitofrontal cortex, and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Well, those names probably mean nothing to you, but they certainly, apart from those who are neuroscientists, but they certainly ring a bell with neuroscientists. Because of these are the same areas or circuits that are involved with a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And they are active in response to other pleasure-inducing stimuli, such as food, sex, and drugs. In other words, any old motivations, any old reward. So many neuroaestheticians think that this is a revelation. They have found the dirty secret of music. It's rewarding because it stimulates, wait for it, the reward centers, where dopamine pathways are found in abundance. In fact, this banal finding is worse than banal. It's embarrassing because it betrays how little is really revealed by looking at the brains of people enjoying music. A science that can't tell the difference between the response to music, drugs, and sex, to getting a hit of bark and getting a hit of cocaine, or between hearing the organ played and having your organs played with, says little <laughs> about either. Surely scientists should wonder whether they're missing something. The discovery that that thrilling master of Renaissance polyphony, Sid Vicious, and the punk rocker Palestrina, wrong way around perhaps, are doing the same thing. And that like the purveyor of soft pornography, Hugh Hefner, and the cocaine baron, Pablo E, I won't give his full name in case he's listening, they are just fellow pushers of stimuli that tickle up the reward pathways. Well, already I hope you're deeply sceptical. Now it's often said that this is early days yet and that the refinement of techniques will bring more consistent and more illuminating results. For as we've seen already, neuroscientific approaches to music involve both teasing apart things that belong together and clumping together things that should be kept separate. Teasing apart the pitch of notes out of the whole experience of music in a real setting and basically keeping together Bach, Hugh Hefner and Colombian marching powder. So we're unlikely to gain much in our understanding of music, even if the present techniques were refined, refined so they could precisely pinpoint the locations in the brain that lit up in response to different tunes. More specifically, it would cast no light on the singular joy that melodies may bring and the ineffable difference between great music and that which is merely competent, between sublime and cheap music between music that makes you feel and think differently about the world and a few nice, hummable tunes. Or between what music means to us 
and what part musical sounds play in the natural world. But there is a much deeper and more important problem about the idea of a neuroscientific explanation of music. For behind this, in, in, the neuroscientific investigation of music is the belief or presupposition that music affects us by virtue of exploiting existing biological mechanisms. In other words, that we have a biological explanation of this supreme art. And of course, once we've got a biological explanation of supreme art, then we're halfway there to having a biological explanation of everything that matters to, about us. Now, others have agreed with this, but then pointed out that since appreciating music is not biologically useful, like feeding or lovemaking, it merely parasitizes or abuses those pathways. In other words, music is a useless exploitation of re reward pathways that should be busy responding to activities concerned with survival, feeding, sex, and so on. In fact, the, order, the cognitive psychologist Steven Pinker has compared music to auditory cheesecake to give pleasure to a brain used to turning sounds into meaning. Zator's observation that those shivers down the spine seem to support that idea. Useless music is linked with other biologically relevant survival-related stimuli via the use of brain circuitry involved in pleasure, and uh, in, in, in pleasure and so on. In short, as Stephen Pinker has suggested, he's an evolutionary psychologist and pretty orthodox, singing is auditory masturbation, and if music vanished from the world, this would have little significance. So it would appear, ladies and gentlemen, that the St. Matthew Passion is a long communal handjob. Thanks to neuroscience, we now know that J.S. Bach was the Hugh Hefner of his time. <laughs> For others of us, however, music is more than something that hitchhikes on biological mechanisms. Some have claimed it has a biological purpose. And this, is cla this claim is supported by the seeming observation that the love of music is supposedly widespread through the animal kingdom. And the conclusion from this, that we humans, like other beasts, are hardwired, and this is the favorite phrase of uh, neuromaniacs, are hardwired to enjoy music. The hardest wiring is supposed to be found in those oldest parts of the brain which we share with other beasts. And evolutionary theorists of music focus on the musical tastes of whales, elephants that play drums, cockatoos that dance, songbirds that appreciate a clarinet, and the ultrasound, ultrasound songs of courting mice. The overwhelming evidence, however, is that our own musical tastes are not hardwired, and those few universals of musical taste that can be extracted from the huge and wide variety of pieces that people enjoy are remote from the stunning singularities of works in a particular genre. Musical appreciation is dependent on culture, memory, mood, and many other factors such as personal taste. Stuart Kelly reminds us of the obvious when he says that each of us brings to a work of art our own histories, memories, connotations, and partialities. We are not blank canvases onto which art is flung or empty vessels into which it is poured. Responses to our culture are not only conditioned by our background, but change over time. Your favorite artist at 16 is unlikely to be your favorite artist at 46, unless, of course, it's Schubert. And it's not unknown for people to argue vigorously in defense of their taste of music for reasons that will have little to do with the dopaminergic reward pathways in the brain. Nevertheless, those who wish to have a biological explanation of music en route to a biological explanation of ourselves seem to have a little more going for them when they consider the creation as opposed to the appreciation of music. After all, there is the striking example of those extraordinary crooners that fly through the air and perch on our rooftops and give us such pleasure in the spring. And doesn't birdsong have an obvious biological function? As Darwin pointed out, in sexual selection, a technique by which males signal to the female populace that they are an excellent genetic prospect. But are birds really musicians like us? The differences between birdsong and human music creation are many and f fundamental. First of all, the creation and or performance of music in birds is universal, at least in males, and not confined to a few. In animals, there is no division of labor between a talented majority of producers 
and a majority of consumers, talented minority of producers and a majority of consumers. How different this is from the situation in humans set out so brilliantly by Levi-Strauss in the passage with which I began. That music is a language by whose means messages are elaborated that can be understood by the many but sent out only by the few. If you're a male bird, basically you sing. It's a biological imperative. What's more, the behavior is switched on automatically, leaving aside a brief trial and error period and a bit of imitation. There's no difference between creation, rehearsal, and performance. There is no laborious practicing or acquisition of the craft of the instrument. The instruments, after all, are bodily parts that grow rather than being manufactured. There are no teachers and mentors, though there is evidence of imitation. The modes of cooperation that we see in human music making, the choir, the quartet, the band, loose elective associations formed to work together are not seen in Birdland. And of course, singing in birds is diurnal and seasonal, but not so in humans, precisely because in birds it is directly connected with sexual selection. If musical creation in humans were about sexual selection, it's difficult to see why I, a man, admire certain male performances and why I would queue for hours to listen to them and why they played such an important part in my own courtship, courtship rituals where my wife-to-be and I went to concert together. Why should I put a rival songster to myself on a pedestal and shell out for two tickets to hear him at the South Bank? As for the artist <laughs> and the role of music in sexual selection, while some performers do indeed seem to be extraordinarily promiscuous, this is more a question of opportunity. What's more, artists seem less keen on gene spreading and child rearing than on copulation without issue. In most cases, however, the career of a musician makes active anti-biological sense. In short, it's worse than spreading one's seed on the ground. There is the love of the craft and of the medium for its own sake that drives the pursuit of an idea of perfection which from the evolutionary point of view is a waste of time, effort, and breath. Secondly, there are easier ways for humans to advertise their genetic health in a manner that will attract mates and ensure the replication, replication of one's genes, namely by indulging in fistfights or by making lots of money. Besides, though this seems to be missed by many biologists, biologists of art, many artists are female. Talking of women, when did you last see a blackbird invite a female to sing along with him? And the dawn chorus is a chorus only to the human listeners, and only the humans probably enjoy it. For the female, if you believe the story, it is a serious business of checking out a partner. This notwithstanding, the science of the neurobiology of creativity, in which a propensity to artistic creation is supposed to be implanted in our brains for adaptive purposes, this science is a growth industry. The results are disappointingly meagre, based on experiments that are remote from the actual processes of artistic creation. At any rate, they have little to say about the creation of music, a process of vision and revision that even in the case of the peerlessly fluent Franz Schubert could sometimes take weeks, a rather long time perhaps, to have one's head in a brain scan. Studies of brain circuits for creativity usually focus only on minimally creative tasks, such as thinking of things one can do with a brick or listing places starting with the letter A, which have little relevance to the kind of creativity that is in play when the eerily beautiful tune of, the, of Death and the Maiden is being transformed into the movement of a quartet opening new kinds of musical space. The often repeated claim that creativity involves lessening of inhibition on novelty seeking and this is due to activity of bits of the brain, such as the right parietal cortex, also tells us nothing. Novelty, per se, is not unique to original art. It's also present in bad art, often accidentally, and in random movements. Artistic innovation takes place against a background of established rules and a feeling for a genre. The extraordinary sense, the exquisite artistic tact that enables great composers to choose enriching innovations as opposed to merely distracting ones, creating new harmonies out of seeming dissonance is not visible to brain watchers. After all, structures such as the parietal cortex are universal, 
operating in musically untalented individuals like me, as well as in the handful of Schuberts the world has seen. And many of their characteristic patterns of action are seen in monkeys, whose contribution to the development of Western music is, so far as I know, fairly modest. Observation of activity in the brain will tell us nothing about why the 12th child of seemingly ordinary Viennese parents was able at the beginning of the 19th century to compose a profusion of works that have transformed the possibilities of music and the way we feel about the world we live in. And the mystery of musical, as opposed to other forms of creativity, is particularly striking, if because so few of us are even able to get to first base, which is what Levi-Strauss is implying. Pretty well anyone can write a third-rate poem or draw a passable picture, but only a minority can compose even a tenth-rate string quartet. Such thoughts might enable us to take a perspective on popularizer Jonah Lehrer's characteristic boasts that biology is now casting light on creativity and the imagination. For the first time in human history, he tells us, it's possible to learn how the imagination works. Instead of relying on myth and superstition, we can think about dopamine and descent, the right hemisphere and social networks. This, I have to say, is a prize example of the BS that is propagated by those for whom brain science must be the key to humanity, and we must be where we seek the meaning and significance of music. I want to now move on from point-missing, technology-driven neurobiological approaches to look at music itself, which will give us some idea of what will be necessary if science really is going to contribute to our understanding music. I want to talk about the meaning and significance of music in particular and the arts in general. Neuroesthetics, by getting so much wrong about the arts, may help us by default to see more clearly the nature of the aesthetic tendency in humankind and how deep it goes and what it tells or says about us. Appreciating that we cannot understand art unless we acknowledge that it is an expression of a uniquely human mode of consciousness is a start. That uniqueness has many aspects, and I can touch on them only very briefly. Let me switch from music to painting and consider the unique freedom that it rejoices in in relation to the human gaze. Our gaze, when we look at the world, is consciously offset from that world. We're not dissolved into or tethered to what we see. And so we have the possibility of elective or recreational looking. And let's consider in a very simple-minded way how that might develop into visual art. Think of a painting. It is a sign of, an iconic sign of, part of, or something in the visible world. It's not simply a mirror image. Few, if any, representations are mirror images. But most importantly, for my argument, art widens the separation between the one who sees and that which is seen, and hence widens the margin of freedom granted to the onlooker. When I look at you over there, I'm separated from you, but still, as it were, spatially connected to you, potentially interacting with you. If, on the other hand, I were to look at a picture of you in an art gallery, that will be a further layer of separation, and the connection will be of a different order, more tenuous and more on my terms. When what is seen is transferred from its primary setting in a visual field to a wall, as in rock art, or to a gallery, it's more securely established as an object purely for recreational seeing. When I see a tiger in a picture, I don't feel moved to run away, and the painted clouds in a Monet don't prompt me to check whether I have my, my umbrella with me. Art is about seeing for the sake of seeing and realizing to the full the potential freedom of the one who sees. Now, that's very superficial and very fast, but I hope it's sufficient to indicate the size and nature of the distance between art and the biology of the organism Homo sapiens. And this applies more clearly to literary art, given that the relationship between the word and what it refers to is not a straightforward one of spatial proximity. Words can be used to signify objects independently of their actual or even possible presence. And this allows an expansion of freedom that is potentially limitless. And though for the most part we use words instrumentally in practical contexts, they may be detached from use 
and enjoyed for their own sake and for the reference they may invoke. I want now to move on from human freedom to knowledge, which takes a unique form in humans, to the point where we may say that man is the only animal that truly has knowledge. And if you don't believe me, you'll be punished by reading that book, which is something like 350 pages long, none of them pleasant. Our knowledge transcends anything that is revealed by experience, although, of course, it is subjected to the tribunal of experience. And very little of our knowledge is utilised to shape our behaviour at a given time, and much of it is never used in this way. My mind is stacked with facts, many of which lie inert from the beginning, of, from the beginning to the end of the day. There are many consequences of our being knowing as opposed to merely experiencing and reacting animals. The most con obvious is that our freedom is extended and we have an enhanced power to act through the sharing of experience and of expertise. That's the upside. But there is a downside. As knowing animals in possession of facts, we are aware that we are a small part of something much bigger than us. We are awake to the reality, the objective reality of our condition. We know that the world would outlast us. As our sense of history and of space and of time grows, so our awareness of our insignificance intensifies. This sharpens our knowledge of our own mortality. Man is the only animal that can see his life as finite and can actively fear death in the abstract, as well as when it is facing him in some concrete form. And the other consequence of knowledge is that our experiences are, as it were, eaten away from within. We are distracted from looking, say by thinking, or merely ruminating. We are frequently mentally not where we are physically. And one manifestation of this is that we have the idea of experiences that actual experiences may not live up to. From knowledge arises our sense of having insufficient reason for our existence and of living a life, even when it goes well, even when we're fortunate enough to be well above the poverty line, a life of incomplete meanings. We are, even if intermittently, aware that we are contingent creatures who will die by virtue of the same accidents that brought us into being. We are aware that we are accidents waiting to unhappen. Which brings me to the third unique freedom, a unique feature of humans relevant to understanding the nature and function of art, hunger. We have basic hungers that are plainly rooted in biological necessity, as in the hunger for food, drink, and so on. And then there are more complex hungers for pleasure that may take their rise from biological pleasures, such as gourmet eating, and others such as stamp collecting that express something a little remote from biology. Then there is a third kind of human hunger for acknowledgement by others, for acknowledgement by a consciousness equal to our own, expressed most clearly in filial, parental, or romantic love. And finally, there is a hunger for the completion of meaning, for something that would offset the effects of knowledge that throws our assumption of our importance into question and eats into our experiences with the idea of the possibility of a perfected experience. I've developed these ideas in more detail in what you'll be glad to know is a small book called Hunger. But it is here or hereabouts we need to understand the look to understand the meaning, the significance, and the nature of art in general, and music in particular. The freedom that comes from knowledge and the wound in our consciousness that arises out of knowledge are both addressed by art. The former is celebrated, the latter is healed. Art is experienced, is experience enjoyed for its own sake and perfected for its own sake. And this has nothing to do with what matters in the natural world, nothing to do with what is of evolutionary advantage, the kind of thing that would be inscribed in the structure and function of the evolved standalone brain. And this is where art is relevant. It matters to us, or we need it, because we've woken to a greater or lesser extent out of the state of an organism. Half awakened, we endeavour to find a unifying or at least non-local significance in our lives. Significance often remains tantalisingly incomplete and stubbornly local, and insufficient to offset what we know about ourselves. And at times, this may open up the feeling that we've not fully realised we exist, not fully realised the scale and scope of what we are and of the world we live in, and a consequent ache to shake off existential numbness, an ache to be truly awake, 
alert, alive. So let's very briefly return to music to see how art might address our sense of being insufficiently there, of our experiences being in some respects unsatisfactory or hollowed out from within. I want to focus on two aspects of music that celebrate and exploit our freedom and do something towards repairing that ache. Feelings on, or emotions on the one hand and form on the other. In great music, in any great art, they are as inseparable as the recto and verso of a sheet of paper. But let me begin with emotions. In us, as in animals, other animals, emotions are physiological storms. And as in the other animals, they may be a response to a particular stimuli. But in us, they are more, much more than this. And one way, not entirely satisfactory, of capturing this more is to say that human emotions are a way of understanding or of being attuned to a world. Indeed, some emotions, joy or depression or fear or hopefulness, may be free-floating and not have a particular trigger, or they ex exceed the particular trigger and become the coloration of an outlook. <coughs> As the great French philosopher Henri Bergson said, emotions are a means of our orientation of awareness to the past and future. Emotions deepen our temporal depth. They widen the window through which we look at the world. And art serves the purpose of further deepening the joy that looks to the future and the sadness that looks to the past. In music, which can be meaningful or significant without being about anything in particular, we have emotions disconnected from specific stimuli, except the stimulus of the music itself. Liberated in this way from local causes, the emotions in it are purified, transformed. Unlike the raw stuff of everyday feelings, the sadness of a slow movement is not contaminated with tears that make cosmetics run and mucus flow. The music's own exquisite architecture confers a structure, even a kind of narrative structure, on the evolution of feelings. How music evokes feelings is unknown, because unlike physiological phenomena, human feelings have an aboutness. They are about the world we are in. Which brings us to form. In a piece of music, each note is fully present as an actual physical event. And yet, because the music realizes a form that shapes expectation and assists recall through conformity to the rules of harmony and so on, the individual notes are manifestly and explicitly part of a larger whole. There's no conflict, therefore, between the form or idea of the music and its actual instance. Thus is experience perfected, fully experienced, and the wound in our human consciousness, if only temporarily, filled. As Yehudi Menuhin once put it, music creates order out of chaos, for rhythm imposes unanimity upon diversity, melody imposes continuity upon the disjointed, and harmony imposes compatibility on the incongruous. Chaos, diversity, and unity, and disjointedness are hardly matters of concern even to our nearest primate cousins, the chimps, whom I doubt suffer from a sense of the unsatisfactory nature of their experiences. Well, it's time to end. You'll be glad to know. This talk is unsatisfactory in many respects, but the two of which I am most, there are two of which I am most conscious. That I've been very sketchy and hasty on the difference between man and other animals, and that I've been equally sketchy on the nature and purpose of art, in particular music. Regarding the first, I hope you've said enough. I've said enough for you to at least be willing to concede there is a huge distance between us and beasts, even perhaps as great as the neuroscientist Ramachandran has suggested, who argued that humanity transcends apehood to the same degree by which life transcends mundane chemistry and physics. And regarding the second, that I've at least said enough about the nature of art for you to accept that it is driven by concerns remote from those that preoccupy animals, remote from those that are suitable subjects for neurobiology as it is present constituted. From this, we may draw two conclusions about neurobiological approaches to music. They bypass its essential character, and they will miss something fundamental, and this is more important, about our unique human nature, from which music and the other arts take their rise. But this, of course, is reasons to rejoice, not grounds for gloom, for it suggests the possibility of an entirely new kind of departure perhaps even a joint enterprise in which biological sciences, the arts, and the humanities 
think how they might work together, but on equal terms. This means they have to communicate in different ways, ways quite different from those indicated by the hybrid pseudo-disciplines, such as neuroesthetics. And even more interestingly, it might drive us to think harder about the way we humans are unique and how, given the truth of the theory of evolution, which I do not doubt, we became so. And in pursuit of this aim, we need to avoid two pitfalls. The theological error of exaggerating our differences from the rest of the animal kingdom and denying our similarities. And the error of biologism, of denying our differences and exaggerating our similarities. Only this way will we be properly embarked on the great intellectual adventure of the 21st century to develop a clearer, more truthful and rounded view of what manner of being we humans are. As to this, music, seen correctly, might give us some insights. In the meantime, it seems perfectly reasonable to concur with Levi Strauss, that music is a language by whose means messages are elaborated, that can be understood by the many, but sent out only by the few, and that it unites the contradictory character of being a once intelligible, untranslatable. And, of course, his conclusion that these facts make the creator of music a being like the gods, or closer at least to the gods than to chaffinches. In Schubert's case, we have a god even more deserving of our thanks for overcoming the indignities, disappointments, endless illnesses, and frustrations of his life to give us a multitude of glimpses of heaven fashioned out of the sounds he heard in his head. So thank you for your attention or for the courtesy of simulating it. Thank you.